Well, good evening, friends. I'd like to welcome you to our Revelation Prophecy Seminar. For this evening, we are going to be examining seminar lesson number five. And this is an exciting presentation. We're going to take you across to Asia Minor. And we are going to go through this incredible study on the seven churches. So tonight we begin the beginning of the sevens, the seven churches. And this is a series that will follow a little later with the seven seals. We'll also deal with the seven trumpets. And of course, we'll deal with the seven last plagues. Let me share with you our discovery points tonight which are theme questions in the lesson. Why does God value obedience and overcoming? Secondly, what does gold tried in the fire really mean for us today? What does white raiment mean? Finally, what is spiritual I self? And which one of the seven churches makes Jesus Christ sick and why? So here we are, we have our seven churches and I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight with praise and thanksgiving, asking again for the gift of wisdom and understanding that your Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us for the seven ignored messages of Jesus. And I'm going to take you through the lesson guide which uh, begins on page one. Thank you so much. The books of the New Testament are largely letters written by apostles to various churches or individuals. Christendom in general accepts all of these letters as God's authoritative word to the church today. But one of the New Testament books, Revelation, bears the name of Jesus Christ himself. In fact, the book is entitled The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It begins with seven specific letters or epistles from Jesus to the churches. Of all the letters or epistles of the New Testament, surely these personal letters of love with special counsel from our Lord should receive the greatest amount of attention and concern by his people. Unfortunately, it is not so. Tragically, these seven imperative letters from Jesus have almost been entirely ignored. In fact, Satan, the arch enemy of God's people, must certainly rejoice that most Christians are not listening to Jesus' important counsel from his own extraordinary book of Revelation. So thank God it's not too late. This Revelation seminar comes to groups with these seven great messages. May the Holy Spirit guide us as we study these chapters, chapters two and three of the book of Revelation, and listen to Jesus' crucial counsel for busy Christians today. So friends, would you join me in section one, the seven ignored messages of Jesus and question one at the bottom of page one in our lesson study guides. This is going to be a great Bible study tonight. It's very exciting. There's a lot of depth. We're going to combine a lot of Bible texts with history, archaeology, and incredible pictures. Question one, what solemn warning does Jesus give in regard to the extreme importance of every word of Revelation? We go to Revelation 22 and verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto, the, unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. 19, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. What solemn warning does Jesus give in regard to the extreme importance of every word of Revelation, friends? We are not to add anything to the book of Revelation or God will add in the plagues. 
neither are we to subtract or remove anything from the book of Revelation or our names will be taken out of the book of life. Why such a serious warning? Friends, it's a very, very serious warning because this involves eternal life or eternal death. And that is why it is so serious. I'm going to switch now to the purple exhibit that you have in your hands. Um, this is an amazing um, exhibit. It is giving us all the information we need. So friends, tonight, most notes for this lesson are on exhibit two. And I'd like to just read to you point number one at the top of the page there. This passage that we just read indicates that everything in Revelation is important and absolutely nothing can be left out, nor can anything added improve it. It was given by God and is perfect as is. Well, that takes us to question two. We're at the top of page two. Where were these seven churches located? This is a very, very crucial question. Revelation chapter one and verse four. John gives us the answer. This message is from John, the Apostle John, John the Revelator, to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So there's our answer. The seven churches are located in what we used to call Asia Minor, uh, which is today the amazing country of Turkey. Friends, I want to give you a little bit of extra. So if you'd like to just have a look at the screen, you'll notice at the end of the last text that we were reading that it says that this message also comes from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Friends, we know that God, the eternal father, is involved in the book of Revelation. We know that God, the son, in the form of the Lamb, Jesus Christ is involved in this message. But we want to ask again, who are the seven spirits? In Revelation 1.4, it speaks about the seven spirits which are before his throne. Revelation 4.5 speaks about the seven lamps of fire. And Revelation 5.6 speaks about the seven eyes of the Lamb. Friends, did you know the number seven is very, very significant in the book of Revelation? In fact, it's written there, 11 times. So there are seven spirits, seven churches, seven lampstands, seven stars, seven heads of the beast, and seven crowned heads of the dragon. There are seven mountains, seven kings, seven seals, seven trumpets, and finally the seven last plagues. So what is the big deal about all the sevens? With so many sevens in the book, we sense that seven represents fullness, completion, and perfection. And as for the seven spirits who are before his throne, we can conclude that they represent symbolically the completeness and perfection of the Holy Spirit. So friends, thus all the members of the Trinity not only bring us revelation, but also greet and bless us. Well, the prophet Isaiah referred to the Holy Spirit under six of his divine attributes, namely the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, meaning power, knowledge, and fear or reverence of the Lord. But in the first part of verse two, not quoted there, it says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And so the Holy Spirit is always the spirit of or the spirit from the Lord. So friends, we are trying to describe in human terms, the throne room of heaven, the power of God, the magnificence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the eternal Holy Spirit. So in the book of Revelation, we have God the Father and God the Son, and they will speak to you directly through God the Holy Spirit. And so the, the whole Godhead are actively involved in this message. I'm going to uh, read the note under the um, answer of question two, which takes us to the purple, exhi purple exhibit and point number two. Have a look at the screen. 
Though these seven letters were originally sent to seven churches in Asia, the messages apply to Christians today, as do all the other letters or books of the Bible. See 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, which makes this very clear. Further, these seven letters have additional application to God's church in seven eras, beginning with apostolic days and ending with the coming of Jesus. So friends, if you have a look on the screen, this seminar has provided you with a very important one sheet overview of Jesus' messages to the seven churches. And there they are. Now, what I'd like you to notice is that these seven churches are also representative of time periods. We have Ephesus and uh, that time period starts in AD 31, going right through to Laodicea which is 1850 till the second coming. So what's this all about? Friends, you need to remember that these seven churches were, yes, real and local churches in Asia Minor, as well as representatives of the universalized Christian church from Jesus' death until his second coming. So the seven churches' messages are also a prophecy that rings down through time and trace the history of the Christian church through all of those ages from the time that Jesus died on the cross until the second coming. So that's absolutely fascinating, isn't it? To notice those dates and we'll notice them as we go through. We're at question three, halfway down page two. Three statements that Jesus makes to the seven churches are so exceptionally important and so relevant to Christians in all eras, that they were given to all seven churches. So what are these three statements that were made to all seven churches? We don't have time to look up all of these verses, and most of them are the same and are repetitive. So let's look at 2.2 2 and 3.15, the first and last of these verses. The Lord says to the first church, Ephesus, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Then Revelation chapter 3 and verse 15, this replies to the church of Laodicea, where the Lord Jesus says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So what are the three statements that were made to all seven churches? Jesus is telling us there that he knows our works. Friends, it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus sees our works or conduct, good or bad, and properly evaluates everything at all times. Keeping this in mind has a dramatic effect upon our lifestyles, doesn't it? And a good motto is, quoting Genesis 16, 13, Thou, God, seest me, and the Lord Jesus, and our Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit do see us at all times. That would be something that we should Remember, let's go back to question three and part B. There are three parts, A, B, and C. Let's have a look at part B. We'll look at Revelation 2, 7 and chapter 3, verse 5. We are looking at another thing that is shared with all seven churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, speaking about the Holy Spirit, saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's go to Revelation 3.21, the uh, seventh promise to overcomers. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, Jesus says, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Friends, I want to ask you a question tonight. With uh, all this emphasis, to the seven churches of overcoming, overcoming sin, overcoming Satan, and overcoming self. Isn't it incredible that in these last days, the Christian churches are not speaking about the importance of overcoming sin and becoming more like Jesus? I'm going to go to our note part B on the purple exhibit. Some teach that we do not have to do anything at all to enter the kingdom. But Jesus didn't teach that. Repeatedly, he clearly stated that overcoming was essential. However, overcoming is not possible 
However, overcoming is possible only through the blood of the Lamb. See Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. Let's have a look at question 3C. Another of the three statements that were made to all seven of the churches, we'll go to Revelation 2, 7 and chapter 3, verse 22. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And then to Laodicea, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Friends, this is a very, very important point. What is the Holy Spirit saying to the churches? And what are the messages that are being ignored today by the last day Christians? That's what we want to know. God's Holy Spirit convicts people of sin and leads them to repentance. See John 6 verses 8 and 13. Without the Holy Spirit, no one ever feels sorrow for sin or finds new truth. No wonder Jesus stressed so forcefully the importance of listening to his voice. Friends, I want to ask you tonight, how are we going with the ability to listen to what the Holy Spirit said to the churches and what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us? It's possible today that when we're in the car, we're listening to the radio, we're downloading a podcast, we're listening to music, we're listening to media, news reports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when can Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, actually speak to his last day church? Is it only maybe when we're on the lawnmower with some headphones on um, to block out the noise that the Holy Spirit can speak to us? Do we have a quiet time where we go walking and we are praying and we're meditating and talking to the Lord? I want to challenge you with that tonight to reconsider how much time you're giving God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit to speak into your heart in these last days. I want to share with you now, here are God's three messages to every person today. They're on the screen. Number one, God knows all about us, doesn't he? So it would be foolish for us to try to deceive him. Secondly, as we've just stated, overcoming sin is very important but it can only take place through my choice and the power of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, we must heed or listen up to the Holy Spirit's voice because confessing and forsaking sin is absolutely important, not only in God's eyes, but also as we try and reflect better the power of Jesus to other people. Because time is limited, as we look at these messages to the seven churches, we'll emphasize only the key points for each era. I'm at the top of page three. Friends, I want you to have a look on the screen. Here are the seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I want you to notice that this is almost a Oz post route of their day, that this was the posties run. And you could visit all these churches by going around in a clockwise direction. I think that's absolutely fascinating. Well, let's dive into our lesson now. We are going to our first church. This is the church of Ephesus, the era of the apostles. And we are looking at the time period that it applies to of the universalized Christian church from 31 to 100 AD. Ephesus the Church of the Apostles represents God's church of the first century. Before his death, around 65 AD, the Apostle Paul could say the gospel had been taken to the whole world. So we go to Colossians 1, 5 and 6 and verse 23. And that's now on the screen. Let's have a look at it. Paul writes to the church in Colossae, which is very close to Laodicea, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Paul is saying, look, you guys have understood the truth of the gospel. And this message came to you as it has come to everyone in your area, in all of the then known world in that area. Let's go to verse 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, Paul writes to the church in Colossae, and be not moved away from the hope 
of the gospel, the hope of salvation, which ye have heard and which was preached to who? Paul says the gospel was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Friends, is that absolutely true? Well, have a look at this chart. This chart is interesting, isn't it? Because it shows in the blue type of the city names there, within that circle, the Christian communities that were Christian in the first century AD or the first century of the common era. There they are. So from Rome and Italy on the left, right through over the top of Asia Minor, down to um, Damascus, um, and down to Jerusalem and Bethlehem, then to Alexandria. So you can see that Paul was saying that, yes, the gospel had gone to the then known world, his known world there in the Mediterranean. You can see from the chart that later Christianity would spread way, way further, right up to the top of what we would call today the United Kingdom. With incredible speed, the church grew to over 6 million, the note says, by the end of the first century. Well, friends, have a look on the screen. I want to take you on a little bit of a tour. So this won't involve any cost, won't involve any long flights, um, and won't involve wearing a mask. So friends, we are going to go to Ephesus. Now, this is uh, Google Earth view of Ephesus. And I want you to notice here that that swamp at the top of the screen used to be where the ocean came in, right to the front of the city of Ephesus. And I'll show you a digital reconstruction of that where the red dot is now. Have a look at the bottom of the screen. We're also going to walk down the marble way, down the main street at Ephesus. And then we're going to go at the end of that street to an archaeological dig where they're digging up houses from ancient Ephesus. And then at the end of the street, that next red dot stands for the Celsus Library. Then we go across to the right where there's a massive amphitheater. Let's zoom out in Google Earth and see what we can see. Well, now you can see that the ancient city of Ephesus is very close to a modern airport, but I want you to look at the swamp because in ancient times it wasn't silted up and there is how the Adriatic Sea was able to come in right to where the city of Ephesus was. Well, we are now in the city of ancient Ephesus. This is the sign that greets you when you walk in through the front gate and walk down that marble way. And that gives you a plan of the ruins. Here is a digital reconstruction by Nemeth Adam, virtualreconstruction.com. There is the harbour. Notice that that is where the port, where the ships dock. Right there, they're up to come right into the city of Ephesus and you can see the significant buildings there. Well, Ephesus was located near the western shore of modern Turkey, where the Aegean Sea meets the former estuary of the river Kastros, and that's what I was calling the swamp. When Augustus became emperor in 27 BC, he made Ephesus the capital of Western Asia Minor. Ephesus then entered a period of prosperity becoming a major center of commerce. According to Strabo, it was second in importance and size only to the great city of Rome. From AD 52 to 55, the apostle Paul lived in Ephesus and this 3D reconstruction is how it might've looked in his time. Ephesus is one of the seven churches of Asia cited in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, let's continue on down this main street. This is what I'm calling the Marble Way. And, you know, how can we understand what it looked like? Well, maybe this will help. There it is. Can you notice the constructions and the color and the life that this city must have had? Well, did you know that Paul arrived in Ephesus having traveled from Corinth? He promised to return after a brief trip there on his secondary missionary journey in Acts 16.6. This is a reconstruction of Coretta Street, one of the three main streets in Ephesus. And of course, in the great city, there were fountains, monuments, statues and shops, and many houses owned by rich Ephesians. Now, I want you to look down that main street, and at the end of the street, you'll see a very impressive temple. 
What was that? Well, this is known as the Library of Celsus. And even today it's pretty grand, but let's have a look at what it once looked like. Friends, Ephesus was a place of learning and 60 years after Paul's visit, the Library of Celsus was built. It was the third largest library in the Roman world behind Alexandra, which was the biggest, Alexandria, and Pergamum. And it was thought to hold around 12,000 scrolls. So it's very beautiful, isn't it? The color is amazing. And there is a full on front view of the Library of Celsus. We'll continue down the marble way past this Nymphaeum. This is the Trajan Nymphaeum or Nymphaeum Trajani which was commissioned by the local aristocrat, whose name was Tiberius Claudius Aristion around 114 AD, in honor of the goddess Artemis and the emperor Trajan. Well, the nymph was an ornate fountain and graced the city center beautifully. But in the central niche of the object was a statue of the emperor Trajan, which was always a very wise thing to do. So friends, there you can see the ruins, there can you see the reconstructions of how this must have looked. The inhabitants of Ephesus worshipped many Greek and Roman gods and there are a large number of sorcerers, a lot of spiritualism and spiritism in the city of ancient Ephesus. Well, Paul had an encounter with some of these, you might remember Acts 19, 13 to 20. The building shown is typical of a temple dedicated to the cult of emperor worship. And Paul began by teaching in the synagogue for around three months before being driven out by Jews who were hostile to the gospel. Let's have a look now at the underground excavations, which is now under a covered over enclosure. So this is one of the houses and here's a reconstruction of what it looked like, a 3D reconstruction of a wealthy house in Ephesus. Well, Paul wrote the book of Corinthians whilst in Ephesus, and in it he writes, a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me, 1 Corinthians 16.9. Well, I think that would be a bit of an understatement in such a wicked pagan city. We travel on down now along the right hand side past the marketplace, the Agora, to the great amphitheater. So here is how the amphitheater, where they did plays and theatrical productions. You might remember the story in the Bible where the mob uh, dragged Gaius and Aristarchus. Do you remember who they were? They were Macedonians who were Paul's travel companions in Acts 19 and verse 29. So these men were dragged into the 25,000 seat amphitheater in Ephesus. Now, Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front to make a defense before the people. He had to justify what was going on, but he was shouted down for two hours by those chanting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Eventually, the city clerk, as you remember, quieted the crowd and finally dismissed the assembly. And that story is in Acts 19, 23 to 41. Well, how does this structure look today? There is the amphitheater, as you can see it if you travel to the ancient city of Ephesus today. I love the way the Turks spell the name of this area, E-F-E-S, Ephesus, Ephesus. When the uproar ended, Paul sent for the disciples, encouraged them, then said goodbye, and he left for Macedonia in Acts 20 and verse 1. So friends, if you look at the size and the scale of this place, you can imagine 25,000 plus people packed in here for the games and whatever productions they were putting on. This was a mighty city. Now, this is not actually on the site of Ephesus, but it's down the road um, a little way from the airport. The Temple of Artemis was located on the outskirts of Ephesus and was listed as one of the seven great wonders of the world. It was dedicated to the Greek goddess Artemis, and she was also known by the Romans as the goddess Diana. There was a thriving local trade selling silver statues of the goddess, which was threatened by the rise of 
Christianity. So friends, there we are. We've gone back to see ancient Ephesus. And now I'm going to ask you to join me back in question number four, halfway down page three. Well, what reproof did Jesus give to this first church, the church of Ephesus? In Revelation 2, 4, we read, the Lord Jesus says to this church via the Holy Spirit, via John, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. This is a condemnation against the city of Ephesus. What reproof did Jesus give Ephesus that they had left their first love? What does that actually mean? Friends, when you first get to know Jesus, you have that first love of knowing and following him. Let me share with you a little bit more about this. A zealous on fire, new Christian who joyously shared his faith everywhere was mentioned on a church board. And an old time member commented, well, one day he'll get over it. Yes, unfortunately, we often do get over our first love. We lose our first glowing love of Jesus and we settle down to formalism. Jesus says that when this happens, we have fallen and we must repent. In Revelation 2.5, loss of love is a fatal disease of the heart which destroys. If we lose love, we lose all. Join me in question five. Jesus commended the Ephesus era of the church for their attitude toward false teachers. But what was their attitude to false teaching and false doctrine? We're in Revelation chapter two and verse two. The Lord says to this church at Ephesus, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them what? And has found them liars. Friends, false doctrine always tries to get into the church. So Jesus commends the Ephesus area for their attitude towards false teachers. What was their attitude? They have tested the false teachers, those who said they were true apostles of the Lord, but were not. What does this actually mean? I'm going to read point number five in the exhibit. Friends, they withstood them openly. Jesus commended them for this. The Nicolaitans of verse six were false teachers who advocated compromise. They felt their spiritual liberty gave them freedom to practice idolatry and immorality. Jesus made it clear that he holds the church responsible to keep wolves out of the flock. Well, I felt that somebody was going to ask me a little bit more about the Nicolaitans. Where does this word come from? Hippolytus, an early church father, identifies Nicholas of Antioch as the founder of this sect. So the Nicolaitans obviously come from Nicholas of Antioch. In the second century AD, this sect appear to have taught that the deeds of the flesh, the body, do not affect the purity or the spirituality of the soul and consequently have no bearing on one's salvation. It's a dualistic philosophy, isn't it? Friends, this false doctrine could tear a church apart because it would lead to immorality, to fornication and to adultery. And then as couples got caught up on this and they separated and half the people side with the husband and half the people side with the wife and this leads the church into disunity. Friends, Jesus is warning us not only against physical immorality and adultery, but spiritual immorality and adultery. And that is by having other gods, many other gods before him. All right, well, it's time to go on to question number six. And we are now going to our second church of the night. This is Smyrna. And we're talking now about the church, the Christian church going through a terrible era of persecution from 100 to 313 AD. Smyrna, AD 313 to 100 AD, covers a period of fearful persecution and martyrdom for the church. The Roman Empire attempted to stamp out Christianity. 
Only God knows how many were decapitated, burned, fed to lions and slain by the sword. The church lived so close to Jesus that he gave them no reproof. So Smyrna is only one of two churches of the seven who did not get um, any reproof or any condemnation from the Lord Jesus Christ. So where is Smyrna? Smyrna is just ahead of Ephesus. I want you to notice there on the screen that it's actually on an inlet, on a bay, and the mountains around that area actually were in the shape of a crown, which is what they were promised. Let's go back to ancient Smyrna. So if we went to Smyrna today, what would we see? And this is what we would see, that ancient Smyrna is a church within the city. And so it's located within modern day Izmir in Turkey. And it's a city that's been almost continuously inhabited for centuries. Smyrna in ancient times was a very wealthy and powerful city. Indeed, it vied with Ephesus and Pergamon for influence in the region. The Agora of Smyrna, which is the marketplace, was built during the Hellenistic or Greek era at the base of Pagos Hill and totally rebuilt under Marcus Aurelius after the destructive um, 178 AD earthquake. And there were many earthquakes in this area. The most important historical structure here is the Agora or the marketplace. And it's one of the best preserved structures of ancient Ionia. They're very, very beautiful, aren't they? Those columns. Friends, arches in the ancient city of Smyrna and Christianity here is thought to have developed out of the large Jewish population that used to live in the area as people defected from Judaism and were baptized into the Christian faith. So that's a quick look around Smyrna as our second of the seven churches of Asia Minor. Please join me for question six at the bottom of page three. What encouragement did Jesus give to the second church, the church of Smyrna? We go to Revelation chapter two and verse 10. Jesus says to them, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation. How long? Notice those words, 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a what? I will give thee a crown of life. Remember I said the crown in the harbour with those hills. What encouragement did Jesus give to Smyrna? He said, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Let me share with you now what the note says on this particular point, which is very, very important. Friends, the 10 days of verse 10, using the prophetic principle of a prophetic day for a literal year, Ezekiel 4, 6, were probably the 10 years of unparalleled bloody persecution under the Roman ruler Diocletian from 302 to 312 AD. Now, you might remember in lesson two, but some of you might not have seen lesson two, that we had a prophetic key where God said in prophecy, Ezekiel 4, 6, I've appointed thee each day for a year. And Numbers 14, 34, each day for a year, the 40 days uh, they would have spent um, searching out the land of Canaan. Uh, then that was applied to 40 years. They would have to wander around the wilderness. So friends, in Bible prophecy, one day stands for one literal year. Would you join me at the top of page four for question seven? What was promised to the overcomer in Smyrna? We go to Revelation chapter two and verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. So what was promised to the overcomer in Smyrna? He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. What does this actually mean? What is this referring to? Friends, all except those translated must die the first death. See Hebrews 9.27. But there is a resurrection from the first death. And we read about that in 1 Corinthians 15.51-54. 
But the second death is the one that the lost, the wicked, die in the lake of fire in Revelation 21 verse 8. But from this death, there is no resurrection. It's time to hurry on to church number three. We're looking now at Pergamos, the era of compromise. Pergamos 313 to 538 AD covers the era of state supported religion and compromise. Christianity had grown so rapidly that there were places where Christians were in the majority. The Roman Emperor Constantine, who you can see in this illustration, professed conversion and even had his entire army baptized as Christians. Very convenient, hey? Well, Satan was unable to destroy the church through persecution, so he corrupted it by popularity, compromise and worldly alliance. Pagan beliefs and practices corrupted the church. Pergamos was called Satan's seat in verse 13 because it was the headquarters of Rome's heathen religion. The Lord rebuked the church of this era for allowing false teaching to flourish. Well, it's time on our map to go to Pergamum. Notice we've gone to the top of this area of Asia Minor from Ephesus, a seaport to Smyrna, a seaport and up to Pergamon that is landlocked. What can we discover about ancient Pergamon where Satan's seat was? Friends, Pergamon is one of Turkey's most interesting and visited ancient sites. No wonder because it's been described as a place of Satan worship. Dating as far back as the archaic period and the surviving structures include the theater, the temples of Athena and Dionysius and the gymnasium. So those structures on the top of the hill, I have an insert there that tells you what they are. So on the left, that uh, bump on top of the hill is the citadel. Then uh, next along is Trajan's temple. Under that is the temple to Dionysius. Across from there is that magnificent amphitheater. And then over to the right is the altar of Zeus. Let's go to Google Earth and you can see the, uh, the layout that the city now is all around um, this area. So let's go to the very top, the pinnacle of the hill and let's have a satellite view. So here we have Pergamon, the ancient city. You can see the temple of Dionysius there. You can see the large amphitheater next to it on the right. And then I want you to notice over on the right, um, there is actually some trees over a square area that is obscured. Friends, this is an altar to Zeus from Pergamon, and there it's highlighted in this model, which is the reconstructed city of Pergamon. So friends, when you go to that altar today, if you are not aware, you would think that this altar has just been destroyed over the sands of time. But the answer is that no, it hasn't. It has been fully dismantled, restored, and was taken across to Germany. This is it. This is the actual Pergamon altar, the original, now reconstructed in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin in Germany. And I was privileged to be there in 2005, and I was able to get a lot of photographs. This is an incredible um, altar. Now, what is very, very tragic is that most people just assume that there were sacrifices here of animals to the gods. But many commentators say that they believe that human sacrifices were made on the Pergamum altar. And that is why scripture condemned the church in Pergamon, because this was such a wicked place, in fact, where Satan's seat was. We now go back to Pergamon on the hill and we look across to the amphitheater area. And as we go, we can see Trajan's temple because Pergamon was a large city. It was significant in both the political and commercial arenas. And the citizens enjoyed very busy lives with all the things that were going on in that city. Well, Christianity in Pergamon was at odds with the city's strong belief and history of the worship of so many pagan gods and also Satan worship. This clash of the Christian and the pagan is something that John's letter addressed, praising those who held fast their Christian faith and warning those who persisted in the worship of 
the pagan gods. So that was a quick look around church number three, Pergamum. Let's go back to our lesson and we're going to have a look at question number eight. Halfway down page four, the doctrines of a man and a group were mentioned. What are their names? We're going to chapter two of Revelation verses 14 and 15. The Lord says to the Pergamon church, I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine or the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So friends, isn't that interesting? The doctrines of a man and a group were mentioned. What were their names? The Lord points out Balaam, who was long since dead, but this spirit of Balaam was alive and well in the city. And also the teachings of the Nicolaitans come up again. I'm going to share with you the note at the top of page two in the purple exhibit. Balaam, according to the book of Numbers, if you read Numbers 22 to 24, was a prophet of God who turned traitors to secure worldly gain and kingly favours. He symbolises the spirit of the Pergamos people when believers compromised true Christianity to gain the favour of Roman officials. Now, it's incredible that God turned around Balaam's prophecy, where he's wanting to curse Israel and God had Balaam bless Israel, and there's also a messianic prophecy there. But if you read in Numbers 31, say verses 15, 16, and 17, it's very clear there that Balaam's work of cursing Israel led to the immorality of Israel and them cohabiting with the Moabites. And what a terrible time of immorality, fornication and adultery that broke out amongst the people. Friends, we are hurrying on to church number four, Thyatira. We're looking at the era of apostasy. Thyatira, the dates are 538 through the 1400s to actually 1500 AD, is the longest period of all the seven churches. This period is sometimes called the Dark Ages, and it was a time of fearful apostasy. So let's go there. Let's have a look. So we're on the downward swing. After Pergamon, we come down. There's another river valley, and this is where Thyatira is. Friends, this is Thyatira today, and it's landlocked within the city. The fourth church, ancient Thyatira, now lies within the city of Akisar in Turkey. Once a city famed for bronze work and weaving, this modern city is now one of Turkey's largest tobacco and olive oil growing regions. The building here is a former Byzantine Christian church that was converted following the Ottoman conquest of the region. So this is just a park in the center of town. The Church of Thyatira was told to persist in their beliefs despite the lack of a strong church in the city. So friends, here are the pillars and these are being reconstructed today um, to make it more of a tourist attraction. Here are some of the artifacts that are lying around. You can see the decorations that this must have been once an impressive area. But unfortunately, there's not much evidence today that Christianity ever thrived in this region. So there's Thyatira, church number four. We go to question number nine at the bottom of page four. The Lord rebuked the church of this era for opening its doors to an evil woman who corrupted it. Well, what was this woman called? Revelation chapter two and verse 20. The Lord said to the church at Thyatira, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. What was this woman called? Her name was Jezebel. Her name is very significant. It means someone who's not honoured, um, certainly not honoured by cohabitation. It has connotations that she's a real Jezebel, that she was immoral and she was a scarlet woman. Let me share the note with you in this area. This is fascinating, point number nine. 
Well, Jezebel was the heathen wife of King Ahab, one of the Old Testament kings of Israel, and she was very wicked and very powerful. We find that in 1 Kings 16, and chapter 16, chapter 18, chapter 19, and chapter 20. Also, 2 Kings chapter 9. Well, she hated and persecuted God's church and its prophets and endeavored to wipe them out. In fact, she imported 850 heathen priests or prophets and instituted an apostate system of religion. She then enforced it by state decree, and they were Baal worshippers, and Baal was another name for Satan. Friends, as they stood up on Mount Carmel, do you remember the story? Elijah stood there and he called down the power of God and the power of God came down. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. Friends, the God of heaven answered and he never answered the false priests of Baal, but he answered for he was the true and living God. And so there was a call to choose ye this day whom ye will serve. In Revelation, Jezebel symbolizes the apostasy that began in the latter days of the apostles. See 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3 and 7. And which grew to such proportions that under the Thyatira era, the church and the world were led into the dark ages. Now I want to share some extra material that's not in the lesson about Jezebel, because a lot of people don't hear the name Jezebel anymore. In 2 Kings chapter 9, 33 to 37, there's an interesting story about this pagan woman who led Israel astray and brought Baal worship in and got rid of the worship of Yahweh. Then God's man and leader Jehu, who God raised up to bring reformation to Israel, he said, throw her, Jezebel, down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And so this was from a great height, and this was, unfortunately, a splatter job. Verse 34. And they went to bury Jezebel, and they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Well, what's going on here? Well, the scripture interprets itself in verse 36 of 2 Kings chapter 9. And Jehu said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spake, the Lord spake, by his servant Elijah. Elijah prophesied this would happen. In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. And so Jehu quotes what the prophet Elijah said, and that is exactly what happened. I've often wondered why this happened. I'm wondering if the Lord God of heaven didn't want Jezebel to have a proper burial and a proper resting place so that people could not go there and build another shrine to Baal or to worship this wicked heathen queen who led Israel astray. God hates immorality, fornication, and adultery. Whether it's physical or whether it's spiritual, he hates it. It destroys spiritual life. We're going to go to question 10. What solemn warning did God give to this symbolic Jezebel and all who followed her? We go to Revelation 2, 22 and 23. Speaking about her, behold, I'll cast her into a bed and then that commit adultery with her into great tribulation. That means a great time of trouble, except they repent of their deeds. See how angry God is in verse 23. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. What solemn warning did God give to this symbolic Jezebel and all who followed her? I'll cast these people into great tribulation, a great time of trouble, and I will kill her children with death. Some versions render the word death as plagues. And if you think through the ages of the Christian church from AD 31 to present times during the dark ages, there were many plagues that killed many, many people and especially the children. Let me share with you the note here. In scripture, the relationship between Jesus and his church is represented by marriage. Jesus is the groom and his church is the bride. Any unfaithfulness to Jesus or his pure teachings is thus called adultery or fornication. The punishments threatened of sickness, tribulation and death are indeed real. 
neither the church, the state, nor false teachers will escape God's punishment for spiritual unfaithfulness or adultery. Let's have a look at question 11. Whom do you think the rest are in the church of Thyatira? The rest of the ones here actually oppose the spiritual corruption of that time period. Who could those people have been? We go to Revelation 2 and verse 24. But I say unto you, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not known this doctrine, which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. Friends, so who are the rest in this spiritual time period? I want to share with you the note. The last part of verse 19 indicates things would finally begin to change for the better. This doubtless refers to the powerful ministry of many great spiritual leaders whom God raised up to expose error and apostasy and lead his church back to Jesus and Bible truth. Their names are well known. Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, and John Knox, etc. Though many of these men served the Sardis era of the church, some had already begun work in the last part of this time period. We'll just have a look on the screen. Do you remember Martin Luther, when Martin Luther nailed up his 95 points or theses against the medieval church? He then began the great Protestant Reformation over Western Europe as people broke away from the Church of Rome and protested that this church during the Dark Ages had fallen away from the purity of God's church. Well, friends, here is a wall, the Swiss Reformation Wall with the four reformers in Geneva. We have there Calvin and Farrell and Bizet and Knox. This remembers the great work of the reformers and the great Protestant movement. Here's a Luther monument at Worms. Worms is in Germany. The three reformers featured a Martin Luther in the center of this statue. Then on the left is Savonarola. 1499 AD, who was burned at the stake in the town square in Florence in Italy. And on the right is Jan Hus, 1415 AD of Prague, who was burnt at the stake also. It's incredible that Martin Luther himself was not killed. I believe God placed his hand over Martin Luther and preserved his life. But these other men were reformers who stood up for God's truth at the cost of their lives. It's time to go on to church number five, which is Sardis. It's the era of Reformation. Sardis runs from 1500 through to the mid 1700s and covers the crucial period of the Reformation when spirit-filled men shook the world by testing Christian beliefs by God's word. Some of these great men of God founded church denominations like the Waldenses, still in existence today. But alas, when they died, their followers ceased searching for truth, compromised what they already possessed, and went backward with astounding rapidity. Well, it's time to go to our map and find out where Sardis is once again in an inland river valley. And we notice as we go to the ancient town, this is quite a big site. Sardis was one of the wealthiest um, of the Roman cities in the area. Here is the Bath Gymnasium complex at Sardis. And I've been there. I want to tell you, friends, this is massive. Um, and this is late second century and early third century after the death of Jesus. It's also home to a significant Jewish population or was. And Sardis was a bustling city important to the growth of the church in the area. And so later on, a Jewish synagogue was built here. Sardis's importance was for three main reasons. Firstly, its military strength. Secondly, its situation on an important highway leading from the interior to the Aegean coast. And thirdly, that it commanded the wide and fertile plain of the Hermus. Friends, I want you to notice this red brick church here. Once a thriving trade center, Sardis today features the remains of a Byzantine Christian church, which was later built on the ruins of the Artemis temple area. Artemis meaning Diana, the fertility goddess. So friends, there are some of the monuments in Sardis. 
It's very, very detailed. Some of it's very beautiful. It's very intricate. And here is the Temple of Artemis. Once a thriving trade center, Sardis today features the remains of the Temple of Artemis, known by the Romans as Diana, but Artemis by the Greeks, who was a fertility goddess. I want to tell you that this fertility goddess had a huge following, especially among the men. Artemis was one of the most widely venerated of the ancient Greek deities. Her worship spread through ancient Greece with multiple temples, altars and shrines everywhere in the ancient world. Her great temple at Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Her main symbols were bow, arrow, quiver, hunting knives, deer, cypress, and these symbols were all sacred to her. This statue of Artemis of Ephesus, second century AD, is in the Ephesus Archaeological Museum today. Now, I want you to notice around her neck is this zodiac showing the influence of spiritualism and Baal worship and Satanism. Now, friends, this reminds us of what was happening in the Bible in Acts 19.19. 19. Some of the Ephesians burned their magic books as the gospel was preached there in Ephesus by Paul and his apostles and disciples. And of course, you can imagine the magic, the spiritualism that was going on there. Also, we've already spoken about the riot. Remember in Acts 19, 23 to 41, Demetrius, the silversmith, was protesting that Paul and his companions were saying that gods of silver and gold were nothing, that they had no power, that they had no influence, and there were to be no other gods before the great God of heaven, Yahweh. And so this caused the riot where they were chanting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So friends, as we go back and look at the ancient sites, it brings a great sense of meaning to understanding what the scripture is actually saying here. And so let's have a look at the fifth church, which was Sardis. We're going to go to question number 12 at the bottom of page five. Well, what did Jesus Christ say was about to happen to the spiritual experience of the church of this era in Revelation chapter three and verse two? Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. So friends, some of these things that were going on in the city, in the church there, their spiritual experience was about to die. Well, what does this mean? Friends, this solemn lesson is for us today to keep pursuing truth and follow it as you find it and blessings will come. But if you refuse to do so, calamity will also come. Jesus reveals light to us gradually as we can handle it, John 16, 12. And if I accept light as he gives it, I receive more till I have full light, as in Proverbs 4, 18 and 19. But if I refuse the light and it goes out, I will stumble in darkness. Join me for question 13 at the top of page six. What striking words describe the condition of the Sardis era of the church as Jesus viewed it in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Friends, what are these symbols all about? Well, the Bible will tell us in Revelation 1.20, the seven stars are the seven angels or the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So friends, the seven stars are merely the seven leaders of the churches. The word translated angel just means in the Greek messenger. So the seven stars are the seven leaders and the seven candlesticks stand for the seven churches. What striking words can describe the condition of the Sardis era of the church as Jesus reviewed it? Thou has a name that thou livest, but this church was really, really dead. Let me read the last note on the purple exhibit number 13. Jesus here points out the formal religion is worthless. Paul describes such religion as having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And that's from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. 
Friends, we have to hurry on to church number six of seven. This is Philadelphia, the area of revival and mission. Philadelphia, mid 1700s to mid 1800s is the area of the birth and expansion of foreign missions and the American and British Bible societies. Missionaries encircled the world. Great revival preachers like Whitefield and the Wesleys helped spark a global revival. The greatest revival since Pentecost was fueled by the study of the books of Daniel and the Revelation. In fact, the name Philadelphia means brotherly love. Philos means love and Delphos in the Greek means brother. So it is the church of brotherly love and it's very fitting. As Jesus looked at his church of this era, he offered no reproof. So of the seven churches, only two didn't get a telling off. They didn't get any condemnation and that was Smyrna and Philadelphia. So there is the church, Philadelphia, in a river valley in the inland. Let's go there today. Friends, there's really not much to see here. It's a city block. And in modern day, Alassa here, which is God's city, it's an administrative area of the Roman Catholic Church. We have the Church of St. John and the Church of St. Jean. They are the key remaining Christian sites of the day. So this is a very, very small site. And artifacts from Alice here's colourful past are found throughout the city. We're in Philadelphia, the area of revival and mission. And question number 14, we're halfway down page six. Well, this church of Philadelphia had difficulties, didn't it? However, with the same group, they had the same problems with the same group as did the church of Smyrna. What was the group called? I think you'll remember the name. I know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the who? The synagogue of Satan. Behold, I'll make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Friends, the church had difficulties, however, with the same group as did the church of Smyrna. What was the group called? They were called the synagogue of Satan. Friends, let us never worship the synagogue of Satan and let us never become the servants of Satan. We are not to become SOSs. Notice that the people of Satan's synagogue, the church, were here pretending to be faithful, true members of God's church. And they did not reveal their true colors. These are the most dangerous emissaries of the devil because they appear so righteous and sweet and loving. Jesus calls them wolves in sheep's clothing in Matthew 7, 15. We can expect the devil's representatives to be devious and deceitful. After all, the devil is the father of lies, as Jesus said in John 8, 44. If we stay close to Jesus and check all teachings by his word, we will not be deceived, as in Isaiah 8, verse 20, and Isaiah 30, and verse 21. Well, in Revelation 3, 7 and 8, God talks to Philadelphia about something opening and shutting. What was it? It's time to have some good news. And to the angel or the leader, the messenger of the church in Philadelphia, write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and has not denied my name. So God talks to Philadelphia about shutting and opening something. What was this? The answer is that it was a mysterious door. What does this actually mean? Well, friends, there's good news. The door mentioned here is the door into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. The door into the most holy place was opened in heaven by Jesus during this actual time period, and no man can shut it. The amazing significance of this event will be studied in detail in two other lessons in the seminar. Exciting events began to transpire in heaven when this door opened. Watch out for these coming lessons. It's time to finish up with Church 7 of 7, the church known as Laodicea, which represents Christianity today. Laodicea runs from the mid 1800s until Jesus comes in this prophecy grid. The heart beats faster as we study about the church of our day. 
These words are direct counsel and reproof to Christians living right now. Jesus knows our spiritual problems and needs. He offers solutions and assistance. So here we are in Laodicea, the end of the posty run. Laodicea is up on top of the ridge in a valley, a river valley in the inland. So let's go there right now. Interesting enough, the word Leo, the seer in the Greek, is two words joined together. Laos means the people. Dicea means judgment or righteousness. So this end time church is when it is the church is going to be judged and it's going to be judged to see if it's righteous. It means judgment of the people. Laodicea was in ancient times a key city in the area, important for trade and as an important Christian site, Laodicea lies a few hours to the north of modern city in Turkey named Denizli. Well, the city was ruined many times by earthquakes before ultimately being abandoned. If you went there today, this is what you'd see. The city had a large amphitheater here on top of the hill, a gymnasium and a amazing marketplace. Well, there are excavation and restoration projects being carried out by the Turkish government, revealing the history and importance of the site and the reconstructed churches and basilicas will feature intricate mosaics. Now, friends, I want you to look across the valley to that white area. What is that? That is Pamakali. Pamakali is the area where the beautiful white travertine terraces are where the hot springs bubble out. So some commentators say there was an aqueduct across the valley that brought the hot spring water across. And by the time it got here, it was lukewarm. So pipes came into Laodicea, but they had calcium deposits from the mineralized lukewarm water. And that illustration, that inset there shows you the pipes that were coming into Laodicea that actually would clog up with all of those minerals. Going across to Pamakali, Pamakali means the cotton castle over on the other side of the valley at Herapolis. It was quite an amazing site. It's not so much today because these pictures are from the past, but today there's a bit of a problem. And that is that these beautiful springs um, are starting to um, decrease. And so if you went there today, when I went there, this is what I saw. And this is one of the photos that I took. And so you can see that the calcium deposits are starting to gum up. And here are some of the pipes actually that you can photograph from Laodicea showing the problem with the hot, then lukewarm water that flows in this region. So let's have a close look at the final message from God to his last day church in Laodicea, judgment of the people. And there on the map, you can see that blue area representing the springs over there of Pamakali over near Herapolis. Question 16, we're halfway down page seven. What did Jesus say our problems are today in Revelation 3, 15 to 17? I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Therefore, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Friends, what an indictment of the last day church. This church is not hot for God. It's not cold for God. It's just stuck in the middle. It's just lukewarm. And this church thinks that spiritually it's rich. It's certainly materialistically rich, but spiritually it's poor. It thinks it needs nothing from the kingdom of heaven. And God sees this last day in rich, materialistically rich churches, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, for it cannot see its true condition. Friends, here is a reference to the lukewarmness as we go back to the travertine terraces and the water that pumps out hot from the springs and then cools down and becomes lukewarm. One commentary said it's been suggested this figurative expression about lukewarmness must have been particularly meaningful to the Christians at Laodicea. One of the chief landmarks of the vicinity has a waterfall over which a stream from the hot springs at Herapolis flowed, leaving behind mineral deposits. 
Laodicea's water source was not these hot springs or a cold one, but a water tower filled by an aqueduct that shows deposits from similar mineral water, probably warm. Lukewarm water was thus a familiar phenomenon to the Laodiceans and fittingly characterized their spiritual condition. So isn't that interesting, friends? This condition of lukewarmness is alarming. Nothing is worse than for me to think I'm in harmony with God's will when instead I'm desperately in need of repentance. See verse 19. Many seemingly devout people, so-called true Christians today, will be lost in the final judgment for the same reason why. See Matthew 7, 21 to 23. It's bad enough to be in trouble. It's worse yet to be in trouble and not even know it. What three things does Jesus counsel me to obtain in order for me to see myself as I really am so I may bring my life into harmony with him? In Revelation 3.18, we get three answers. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried, tested, or purified in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. The three gifts that God gives are gold, a precious man, white raiment or clothing, and eye salve or medicine. What do these things actually mean? We'll find out in question 18. Please direct your attention to the screen. So what's the meaning of gold, white raiment, and the eye salve, which we call today eye ointment? Gold means the true riches of heaven, which are manifested in a golden character, which will stand up under the fires of persecution and adversity and will not embarrass the kingdom of heaven. These people are true witnesses to Jesus Christ all the way to the end, come hell or high water. It also includes God's word, Psalm 19, 7 to 10. It also includes faith, which works by love, Galatians 5, 6, James 2, 5, and Job 23 and verse 10. We come over the page to the top of our final page, page 8. What does right white raiment mean? What does this mean? We don't use raiment anymore. It means Jesus' robe of righteousness. Isaiah 61 and verse 10 and Revelation 19 verse 8. It's given by Jesus as a free gift. We do nothing to earn it. We receive it by faith alone. Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. And it's retained only by faith in Jesus. Romans 1, 17. Finally, what does the owl self mean? What does it mean? Well, I actually found online on the internet some eye self, the wild woods wellness, dark circle eye self, bringing wholeness, peace and vitality. Now I'm not sponsoring this. I don't know how it works, but I thought it was interesting. There still is eye self. I don't think it's for the eye, but for dark circles under the eye. So eye self is still available today. I think many of us actually use eye drops. Well, eye self in these ancient times meant discerning, understanding God's word, as in Psalm 119 verse 18 and 1 John 2, 20 and 27. It also means the Holy Spirit, which will help us to see our true condition and make proper choices, John 14, 26 and Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. Question 19, what must I do to be certain that the precious gold, white raiment and eye salve are actually ours in Revelation 3.20? Here's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Friends, if we open wide the door and let Jesus enter our hearts and life, that is how we receive the gold tried in the fire, the white raiment and the eye self. They will become ours. Though Jesus can open many doors, he will not force open the door to our hearts. This is something that we must do ourselves to let him in. The special words of Jesus Christ to his church through seven eras ends on a somber note. His last day church is not ready for his appearing. Wake up. His counsel to us in Revelation 3 is fantastic. However, he has much more to say to us in the remaining 19 chapters. Some of this counsel, friends, is going to be shocking and startling. But since it is his counsel, 
I hope that you feel like I do, that we want to hear it anyway. Finally, Jesus offers to us the pure robe of his righteousness that we may be clothed in Revelation 3, 18 to 20. I'm asking you tonight, are you willing to accept his robe of righteousness? And my answer is yes, I sure will. I want that robe in which there's not one thread of human devising. It's all his mercy and his grace and his love. I hope that you can say amen to that. Our discovery points that we started with tonight. Number one, why does God value obedience and overcoming? It's because God needs to fully trust us for all of eternity and he must test us now before he takes us to heaven. Number two, what does gold tried in the fire mean? It means a golden character just like Jesus Christ. It also means faith that works through and by love. Well, what does the white raiment mean? We just learned it means taking Jesus' righteousness on as our own. His robe of righteousness becomes ours. What is spiritual eye salve? It's about allowing the Holy Spirit to work on our sinful hearts and helping us to confess and forsake our sins. And number five, which one of the seven churches makes Jesus Christ sick and why? Can you remember? Which one does he want to spew out? You know, if you drink lukewarm water, you'll know the answer to that. The seventh church is Laodicea, and it's lukewarm. It's lukewarm in its message. It's lukewarm in its behavior. It's lukewarm in its attitude to overcoming sin. And that's why it makes Jesus Christ sick. Friends, these programs are also available on the YouTube channel, True Blue SDA. Friends, I want you to notice here at the end, there's counsel to the seven churches. Take time to go through it again. What is the take-home value tonight? Number one, to Ephesus, they were to repent and get back to their first love. The promise was that they would then eat of the tree of life. Smyrna was told to be faithful unto death. Their promise to overcomers was to receive the crown of life and not be hurt by the second death, which is the lake of fire, eternal death. Pergamos counsel was to repent. Their promise for overcomers were to receive the hidden manna, the white stone, and the new name. Thyatira was told to hold fast what you had already, continue on. And their promise to overcomers was power over the nations and to receive Jesus Christ, the morning star. Sardis was told to watch and strengthen what remains and to hold fast and repent. They were told that they would get white raiment and their name would be kept in the Lamb's Book of Life. Philadelphia was told to hold fast to the faith. They would become a pillar in the temple. They'd be kept from the hour of temptation and have the name of God written on them. Finally, Laodicea was told to secure gold tried in the fire, white raiment, I self, to be zealous and repent. Their promise to overcomers was to sit with Christ in his throne and to eat with him friends the messages for the seven churches tonight are very powerful messages to all of us i have two response questions for you tonight do you believe more and more that revelation has a message for today's christian if so place a tick in box number one question two if you want to receive of his gold his robe and his eye self so you can please the lord and be a wide awake christian and be ready when jesus comes please put a tick in box number two well, tonight our quiz is just true and false. Question one, the revelation of Jesus Christ is very important. Strong warnings are given to those changing it in any way. Is that true or false? Lock in your answer now. And the answer is true. Absolutely. Number two, overcoming Satan and sin is a predominant theme to all seven churches. True or false? I think that's very easy. Lock it in. The answer is true. Number three, the gold tried in the fire represents character, a faithful character that works by love. True or false? Lock it in. And the answer is true. Question four, the Laodicean church was actually aware of its condition. True or false? Lock it in. And the answer is that it was false. It was unaware of its condition. It did not know that it was miserable, poor, blind, and naked question seven the seven churches show christianity's history from apostolic times until the present and friends that is absolutely true so give yourself a score out of five and thank you for sending that to me 
as soon as you can. In Revelation's Wall of Truth, tonight we learned the seven churches are seven messages that were for the future in Jesus' time. But today we learn that if we open the door of our heart and accept Jesus now and continue to have a relationship with him and repent and confess, we will be overcomers. Isn't that great news? Well, what's going to happen in session number six? We're looking at the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's absolutely incredible. And it's called Christ's Glorious Return, which is Revelation Seminar Lesson number six. We're going to learn why does Jesus come back in the same way that he left? Secondly, why will only a few see Jesus Christ return? Number three, will we sleep through the second coming? Number four, why is heaven empty for a week of earthly time? And number seven, number five, what's the test for knowing the difference between Satan's false coming and Jesus' true coming? Let us pray. Our gracious heavenly father tonight, as we've gone into the seven churches of the book of Revelation, we can see very clearly there is a message for us to remember, to repent, and to return to our first love. Father, tonight we ask the Holy Spirit will fit this message to every heart. We'll go away and study this more. We'll think about it more. And we'll ask Jesus more fully into our hearts and make a full surrender to him. Bless everyone who hears this message that they might have that experience. I ask it in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Let all the people say, Amen. I want to thank you so much for being with us this evening. It's been great to be together as we've studied the seven ignored messages of Jesus Christ. So I want to thank you for being with us and say thank you and God bless. And I look forward to seeing you next time for session number six.